If you would, please take your Bibles and turn with me once again to the Epistle to the Romans. Epistle to the Romans, chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. The apostle says, under inspiration of God, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I hope at this point in our journey through Romans, that you recognize that the apostle has a cycle of teaching. He cycles into some very difficult and hard truths, and then he cycles into some very comforting and passionate truths. If you were unsettled by the last two weeks, if the heavy truths of God's predestination, of God's election, were something that you wrestled with and struggled with, that you turned the pages of Scripture to see if it were true, or were something that made you leave here thankful to God that you were saved, praising God for who he was, but still just uncomfortable with the reality of it's outside of your control and, and beyond your understanding, then this passage now lifts you up, puts you back on track, and restores and reaffirms the assurance of salvation and the simplicity and beauty of the gospel of grace. This passage lays truth out in a very practical perspective. He starts off by saying, yes, I know what I just communicated to you was hard. I know what I just wrote in that previous passage was something that was a, a, a heavy truth. But I want to remind you again, as I spoke to you earlier, he can say, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Remember, the broader context is the question of what about Israel? They were the ones who had the law. They were the ones who had the covenants. They were the ones who had the culture and the temple. Why are so many of them not believing in Christ. And of course, then he teaches on the reality of God's working, of God's predestination. And his ultimate answer is, God's will is God's will, and he will have mercy on who he has mercy. He says, but don't get me wrong. Though I know God's business, and though I'm not going to mess with God's plan, and though I am not going to say that it is up to you or to me to save souls on any level, I want you to understand, he says, that my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I know some of them won't, but that's not going to stop me from preaching and proclaiming and serving and moving in this way. I know I could sit home and work on tents or work on scholarly efforts. I know that I could fade into the wilderness and just commune with God. But my heart's desire is for Israel to come to know the Lord. And my calling, even if 
they don't come to know the Lord is to teach and to preach and to help them at least have the chance of knowing the Lord. And so, here, with this passion, with this heart's desire, he now circles back to explain some of the basic and core elements of what that salvation is and of that reality of Christ's gospel. I have at the top of your outline a verse that works with this sentiment. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Remember, though there is condemnation under, under sin, Christ has come into the world and held out in invitation and in reality to be accepted, to be believed upon, so that they might be saved. And in holding that out, Paul was expressing his heart's desire and is living in that heart's desire. He says, look, I know, I bear witness that Israel has a zeal for God. Of course they have a zeal for God. They have set themselves up as the nation state of God. Of course, after exile, their zeal was fanned a little bit by saying, we saw how God punished us. We saw how we were judged and we don't want to go down that road again. And so we can see the zeal of the Pharisees, the zeal of all the sects that existed in first century Israel. You can see the zeal of them wanting to break free from Rome. You could see the zeal of the Apostle Paul in Romans before he, in Acts before he is converted. That's a zeal. He says, I know they have a zeal for God, but their zeal is not according to knowledge. That is not according to the real truth and application of Scripture. Their zeal is according to a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation, and a false knowledge of the reality of God's teaching. He says, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. From a pa practical perspective, ministry is able to impart a knowledge of God. Just from an earthly practical perspective, Sunday school, radio ministry, YouTube ministry, worship service, Bible studies, prayer meetings, we can impart a knowledge of God. But grace, I mean, knowledge of God, what grace is, what redemption is, and like all of that, all that stuff. But if a person will truly submit to the righteousness and salvation of God, it has to go a step beyond just a knowledge of it. He says they are ignorant of God's righteousness. They are ignorant of the truth behind all the knowledge of the scriptures that they seem to have. They are ignorant behind it because instead of embracing and submitting to God's righteousness, they have created their own. Paul, the aim of Paul's ministry in fleshing this all out, in fleshing out his heart's desire, is to break down what these righteousnesses are and then show them the true righteousness of God. So, there is a righteousness that has been created by people. And what he is going to do is show that that is insufficient. He's shown it before. Scripture will always testify to the insufficiency of the righteousness of people. But this passage, and certainly our understanding of the gospel as a whole, is something that we also continue to do after the order after the example and after the instruction of the apostle here. Everyone has created a sense of righteousness that is in and of themselves. We know very well that we can call our culture a rebellious culture today. We can call it an unrighteous culture. We can call it a sinful culture. But that term can be applied to every culture, really. But what you can say about every culture, even in its sin, is that it always has its own idea of righteousness. It always has its own idea of what is being pursued and what they need to live up to. It's cliche almost now, but many people will say, 
I think I'm a good person. I think I'm okay. I haven't killed anybody. I'm a good person. Why do they think that? Well, the evidence they give, I haven't killed anybody, is an evidence of obedience of some sort, right? There is some evidence of obedience. I, I pay my taxes. I don't steal from the grocery store. I uh, could get involved in community service from time to time. It is always an element of obedience, an element of righteousness. I think I am a good person, and here is the evidence of my goodness. And so this idea that this is a righteousness that is that is of their own, establishing their own righteousness, but has not been submitted to the righteousness of God. That is the same in the, eye, in the eyes of a first century Pharisee as it is in the eyes of our modern Pharisees. What would a Pharisee say? I've kept the law. I've been righteous. I've obeyed. And when really we know in their hearts they have not. What was the aim of Jesus' ministry? To expose the inconsistency of those who thought they were righteous. To expose the fact that they couldn't keep the law. To expose the fact that no one could be perfect. He even goes so far, he, goes, he says, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Why do you think, he says, it is written, but I tell you. When it comes to murder, if you look at your brother in hate, you have committed murder in your heart. Because he wants to say, look, even though you haven't killed anybody, you have felt an, and f the sentiment of it as a fallen human being. You have desired the, des the destruction of an image bearer of God, even if it's just on a fantasy level. You haven't committed adultery? Oh, well, anybody who looks at a woman has already, in lust has already committed adultery in their heart. You can't live up to the standard of the law. And now if you try to live up to the standards that Christ is setting out there in your heart, you'll never achieve that. You'll never be perfect in your heart. He's not saying, hey, look, here's the bar. Here's where the Pharisees put the bar. I'm going to put the bar higher, guys. Good luck with that. He's not doing that. He's saying there is no way you can ever reach the bar. I am here to reach the bar for you and to fulfill that. And so this idea of modern morality that we even have in our own day where you're a good citizen in the 21st century if you, you know, have all these qualifications of, of tolerance, of passivity, or uh, uh, that you, you, know, you recycle and all this stuff. These are all these things that our, our, our society looks at and says that's commendable. They're a good person because they do these things. will never get you anywhere. It is a righteousness that has been created. Whereas God's righteousness... The law, the objective morality, is always out there. And while you may be able to meet your own standards, you might be able to eat the right foods and stay sustainable and buy clothing that isn't made in, in, in sketchy places and all those things. You might be able to do that. But you will never be able to keep the objective law of God, which is why the righteousness and submission to the true law of God is important to be known and to be taught and to be understood, which is why the church of God cannot back down on the moral law of God. The church of God cannot back down on the righteousness of God because that righteousness will always show you your need of forgiveness and of salvation. And... The apostles make it very plain that those who have their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God because in order to do that, they have to give up their own righteousness, which is painful and difficult without the grace of God. In verse 4, he says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Verse 5, Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. Verse 4, Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. The man who does these things shall live by them, but we know that he cannot live by them. And so Christ is the end of the law. What does that mean? 
Does that mean that Christ destroyed the law? No, he says very plainly, I've not come to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill it. He's the end of the law in that he is the embodiment of it. He is the epitome of it. He is the living, breathing word of God. He is word of God incarnate. He is law of God in flesh, as it were. And as perfect, righteous, just, holy, total God-man, he was able to pay the penalty for all the sins of all the earth. He was able to live that totally just, righteous life. And in doing so, and in shedding his blood, and in dying and having victory over, his, over sin, he is become the embodiment, the fulfillment, the end of the law. The end of the ceremonial law? The book of Hebrews tells us and teaches us that all of that is done. He has offered one sacrifice forever, and now he sits down at the right hand of God. Everything in the book of Leviticus that deals with the ceremonies, everything you find about the temple in Exodus and the tabernacle in Exodus that deals with the ceremonies, that is all fulfilled in Christ. He is the one final end of all that that was foreshadowing and all that that was testifying to and all that that was looking forward to. His blood is the very last sacrifice that is ever needed. It is finished, it is done. Ceremonial law fulfilled in him. He is the end of the judicial law. What you find now is the nation state of Israel is no more from a biblical perspective. All instruction is to the church, which is certainly the people of God on earth. It is the kingdom of God on earth, but it's not set up as a political entity. And so all the judicial laws, the penalties, the ifs, thens, or buts are fulfilled in Christ. He is the end of the law because that nation state of Israel is done and now it is open to all nations, tongues, and tribes to be part of the kingdom of God in the spiritual entity that is the church. Though it has a visible footprint on this planet, it is not a political footprint. And that is where the fulfillment of the judicial law is found. And he is the end and fulfillment of the moral law. As was already explained, we can't keep it. We need to love it. We need to live in it. We need to obey it. But we look to him as the fulfillment of it. The moral law shows us we need Christ. The moral law shows us the character of Christ. And the moral law shows us how to apply Christ in our lives with those principles and standards that are so set down in the word of God. He is the fulfillment of that law in that we depend upon whole, him wholly in that righteousness. He is our righteousness for those who believe. His righteousness is imputed and applied by faith. It's not a self-created morality, but it's a God-given morality. It's a God-given righteousness. And it is a righteousness that comes from above that is never created that is never, never able to be able to f be fueled by our pride and by our actions. It is purely a gift. He says, look, I will illustrate this even further. Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, and do, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. He's bringing this from Deuteronomy 30, verses 12 through 14. Yeah, Deuteronomy 30 talks about the essentials of obedience and of following that. But he says, look, this word is near you. This faith is given. Belief is all. Christ is the end of all that. Christ is the fulfillment of that. The work is finished. You don't have to do what he did. You don't have to do the work of Christ. Christ has already came and lived. He's already suffered and died. Don't say, who will go up into heaven and come down? 
Don't say he already did that. He already came down and lived on earth like a man. Don't say who will rise up from the dead to bring He already rose from the dead. He already fulfilled and accomplished everything that was done. What do you have? The word of faith. The word of faith is near you. Believe on that, trust on that, hope in that, follow that, live in that, embrace that. This word of faith is not for you to be the righteous one, not for you to suffer like Jesus did, not for you to earn any smack or bit of salvation, not for you to find any uh, of your own self-created righteousness, but for you to embrace the word of faith. For you to live in that which the apostle is here preaching and teaching. Don't create, don't create new stuff. Don't regurgitate what Christ has accomplished and done. Don't think that you have to, when we talk about modeling Christ, and when we talk about walking after Christ, we're not talking about living through his passion. We're not talking about wearing the wounds of the Lord. And lest you think that's a little ridiculous or a little far-fetched, if you know your history of, of Christendom, you will know that there were segments of Christendom where to wear the markings of Christ was considered an honor, or to mimic the suffering of the Lord was considered an essential to faith. You will know that those perversions existed, and you will know that people's hearts are inclined that way. And so for him to say, don't think that way, but go to the completed and fulfilled word of faith, the belief, the faith that is yours, that is what needs to be embraced and that is what needs to be lived in. What are you looking for beside that? What about Christ is not enough? And what about him does not satisfy? What has he not fulfilled? What has he not completed? The word is a one in all. And so with this, with this basic understanding, he then goes into one of, the, one of the clearest verses in Scripture about the assurance of your salvation and of, the, of what your salvation is in, in our testimony. He says, the word of faith which we preach, that is, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved from imparting of the knowledge of the gospel to by grace and understanding of the gospel to by grace and expression of belief. I said already, knowledge is not enough. Action is certainly not enough, is what he says with the previous verse. But the heart of conviction overflows in word, in truth, and also in action. So he says, if you believe, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Start with belief. Believe in your heart. Here's something that we know what it means. We understand what it means. But it's a difficult thing to really express and to... Uh, scientifically parse out what real belief is. Belief, something akin to conviction, something conven con akin to based on this evidence, I believe this, but not something that can be mathematically demonstrated. For those who are math brains, and I am not, you can put up an equation and you can say, here is the demonstration of the proof. I believe I can do that with the scriptures, but I cannot do that with, the, with someone's heart. And that is where this gets sticky. But the scripture talks about firm belief, believing that the Lord Jesus died, was risen from the dead, believing in him as Savior, with firm belief, there is salvation. Belief based on truth. Belief based on reality. Belief based on the fact that he existed 
and belief based on what he has told us is not a lie. I believe that. And we all know that there is a, 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 a part in our lives, a part in our experience where we go from mm, to yes, I believe that. And so that belief that he's expressing in verse 9, what he starts off by saying, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, that belief will, will essentially also have confession. The title of this sermon is Profession Unto Life. It could also say Confession Unto Life. We confess our belief, and our belief is a profession. And with that profession, we can speak to the life that we have in Christ. And so that firm belief that we have in our heart, that conviction, again, that supernaturally comes from God as the ultimate source, but based on the truth as we know it and understand it, immediately comes to an expression from heart to mouth. There is no true belief without confession or profession. There is no such thing as a closet or undercover Christian. There is no such thing as a Christian who believes but never expresses it to anyone and never lives in a way that shows the expression of that. It doesn't exist. Hand in hand, if you believe, someone's going to know about it. You can't help it. It's there. It's part of that firm and true belief, which is an element of being able to tell the truth of that, the reality of that belief. I know people get caught up with the, uh, what seems to be demonstration of church membership sometimes. But do you understand that church membership is really just you saying, I'm going to profess publicly my belief I'm going to profess publicly my belief, and I'm going to profess that I am part of this local body. The same would be with baptism. Baptism and church membership are really, one in, really hand in hand. And so if you express your belief, you get baptized. And that baptism is a profession and confession of your belief in the truth of the gospel. These things are not meant to just be uh, rituals. These things are not meant to be, oh, now we have a name on a list. These things are not meant to be just empty human tradition. This is something that is devised from professing your faith and from not being ashamed to go before the church of God and say, I believe because God has worked in my heart and God has saved me and God has raised me up. And the evidence and assurance of that belief is my profession to you and I put myself before you to testify that the further evidence and assurance of my belief and my identity with Christ and his kingdom is the life that I am now living after God and in God. I've said I believe. I confess it. Now, see the character of my life as I grow closer to the Lord Jesus every day and every year. And I observe the character of my life changing as I grow in the faith. What do I find appealing? What do I now find unappealing? What is my new attitude towards work, towards people, towards church, towards God, towards the news, towards politics, towards serving others? What is my attitude towards these things? Has it changed? Do I find new excitements? Do I find new and substantial ways in which my life has meaning because I know the Lord? This is the evidence of demonstration. This is faith in action. And at the end of the day, I still boldly say, all that you see of Christ in me, God did that. I didn't do that. God did that. Matter of fact, what you see in me that you don't like I will take all the blame for that. But what is of Christ? God did that. And that is the evidence, hand in hand, with our belief, our profession, our demonstration, all fit with our assurance. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, he says, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is the key in the basics of our belief and expression of our belief 
in this new life, in this gospel, in this Christian kingdom. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew, or Greek, Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Belief in the one who covers and forgives. With belief there is no shame. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That is no embarrassment. No death, no judgment, no condemnation, no eternal corruption, no shame, no exposure. So many people live their lives in fear of shame, in fear of exposure. They lie so much that they forget that they are even guilty of the things that if people found out, would be appalled by. Well, you know what? God knows those things. He knew those things from the beginning. He knows those things all throughout. And He loves you and has bought you and has forgiven you anyway if you are His. And in Him there is no shame. The idea that you'll sometimes see that God is going to play your life on a movie screen when you die and he's going to say, oh, oh, shouldn't have done that, is trash. That is not in scripture. There is no shame to those who are in Christ. Whoever believes on him is covered, is fulfilled, is cleansed, is adopted, is made whole, is healed. And so what we do is we know all that shame and we hand it over to him and we call for God's mercy. And we will have it. Call on the name of the Lord. Call on who? The God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one true God. Call on him and you will be saved. There is a specific Savior to call on. You cannot call on Odin. You cannot call on Zeus. You cannot call on Allah. You cannot call on Buddha. You cannot call on these other gods. You can only call on the triune God, the Lord Jesus Christ, as Savior. It is very exclusive that we call on God's mercy in that specific, narrow way. And when we do it, when we do it with sincerity, when we do it with an expression of faith and understanding of who he is and what he is, we will have his mercy. We will have his salvation. We will have his grace. So while the Savior is very specific, the made-up word, save ye, the one who is saved, is not specific at all. He says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. It might be a specific Savior, but the reception is to all who call upon him. There is no prejudice from God based on anything in you. Your background doesn't matter. Your works do not matter. Your history does not matter. Your ethnicity does not matter. Your previous religion does not matter. Your previous culture does not matter. Your family does not matter. Your politics do not matter. Nothing matters for you to be saved. Call on the name of the Lord and he will save you. All I have, all, all have equal opportunity to repent and confess. All have equal opportunity to believe and all have equal opportunity to live. That at the name of, the, of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. For all know that he is the Savior. And this is what we preach. This is what we proclaim. He says, he says, he is rich to all who call upon him. His richness is abundant. Those of us who know that richness, we know that care, we know that love, we know that comfort, we know that peace, we know that mercy, we know that abundant richness that is unequaled by anything else that is out there. And his richness is there for any who would trust and call upon him. All in the wonderful words of life that we have a part in expressing, that we have a part in administering, that we have a part in teaching, that we have a part in, in, in evangelizing. This is, I say this before, this is our church. This is our time. This is our ministry that God has entrusted us with. What can you do to proclaim the mercy of God in your world? What can you do to profess your belief and his righteousness more? What can you do to be involved in expanding and building up his name and his mercy and his truth more? 
What can you do to help and to proclaim his great mercy and his great faith? We know that this message is not meant as a message to condemn, though that certainly is an element of the whole picture in God's eyes. But Christ came to save the world, to save those who would believe on him and to trust in him. We profess that right we, by his grace and by his working, carry on our belief, carry on that profession, that all who hear may also profess unto that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the real truth that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that he has raised us from the dead, we, will, we are saved thank you for that assurance. We thank you for that clarity. We pray that everyone in this room would reaffirm that right now, would reaffirm that belief. And if there is someone in this room who has never affirmed that belief, I invite you now to affirm it before God. That I believe. Help my unbelief. Forgive me of my sins. May I lean wholly on you for that forgiveness. May I trust in you. May I profess that trust and that belief. And may my life express it. Lord, we pray that you would please work in the hearts right now to make that the sentiment of everyone in this room and everyone who is ever under the sound of this message. We pray that your power would work right now to revive hearts, to awaken souls to this truth, that we all may profess unto life all may live to serve for your honor and glory. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you that your mercy is abundant and free. Thank you that while you, the Savior, are one and only, we all can call upon you no matter what. We love you for this. We praise you for this. We worship you for this. We glory in you for this. And we pray that you would go with us in all that is ahead and undertake for our ministries of profession. We ask it in Christ Jesus' name.